Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. It is now episode 471, recorded on October 11th, 2017. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. I'm Sebastian Peek. And I'm Ken Addison. And apparently I don't get a lower third. I don't I don't rank in the whole group here. You want me to well, give you a lower third? I, I, really don't, I really don't want you to give me a lower third. I like right. to remain as that, anonymous as possible. Just put your name on that possible. screen behind you. Yeah, there we go. Mm-hmm. Let's just get a piece of scratch paper. Sharpie. You'll be fine. I should just get a name tag. Duh. Hello, my name is... Mineral Oil. <laughs> Turn. <laughs> oh... It will never die. You can die. get all of us at podcast at pcper.com. You can watch this at uh, percyper.com slash podcast. Percyper. Percyper. You know, I'm not really drunk. Percyper. It's just so weird hearing myself all the time. Two seconds after I say a word. I hate you. You can also follow us at Twitter. Twitter.com slash Ryan Shroud. Twitter.com slash pcper. And uh, if you want, you can join our spot spam list that we've talked about ad nauseum, seemingly. Uh, go on the website, check that out, submit your name, well, at least your email address. We will talk to you, notify you when new things come up. And I'll tell you, it feels like I'm reading some cards because of the latency. This is a lot of fun. But yeah, we're not going to use it for anything else. Not even Ken has access to it. Not that he would do anything. What? No. Me? Never. Hey, wait. It fixed. Yay! Oh, that Thanks, only Skype. took a while. Yeah. We love Skype. But anyway, now that I no longer hear myself, I can be a little bit more melodious. You sounded a little bit no like superfluous because I have absolutely nothing really good to say. Right. Uh, you know, unfortunately, since Ryan is not here this evening, obviously, we will not be able to read off any of the new Patreon names. However, if you do feel that this podcast and this website does profit you, you too can spend your hard-earned lucre to keep us afloat and allow you to listen to us. Now, if that doesn't sell a thousand dollars worth of Patreons, nothing will, right? Well, can, 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 it was can heartfelt. Just, can just crash the yeah, browser too. The browser crashed on Ken. <laughs> so maybe that's why I'm no longer hearing myself. <laughs> I would be impressed. <laughs> Is it my fault, or did I do a good thing? Who's that's a really good who's question. No mm-hmm. hiding. It's all about perspective here at PC Perspective. It sure is. Anyhow, uh, you know, uh, Ryan, every Thursday? Is it Thursday or is it Friday morning? Uh, th- they go up Thursday bag. evening, usually, I believe. Okay, But anyway, he uh, spoke at uh, length, about 20 to 30 minutes. Every week, uh, your mailbag questions will be answered by Ryan. If he deems the questions appropriate and of good enough quality. So he has ignored everything that I've ever sent him for the past three years. I think my stuff just goes straight to the spam folder, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, watch those uh, again. That's that's part of the Patreon stuff that uh, we're expanding our content. We're trying to get more stuff out there, more entertainment, more information for you guys, uh, because you really are the reason that we're here. That and every once in a while, somebody sends us a video card. And beer. And beer. beer No, nobody sent us beer for a while. But however, they they are sending us defective laptops. It is a Lenovo. (laughs) The update killed it, Ken. You're doomed. Now, this has been a somewhat busy week. Uh, The big news, of course, is the Coffee Lake review that was released shortly well the day after the uh the podcast last week so we were not able to to talk about it and so this is the 8700k and 8400 review and uh of course you know what we know about coffee lake is it's 
an expansion upon Skylight. I mean, it, we do not see any real huge increase. Is it Skylight that was previous? There's so Cabby damn Lake. many. Or Cabby Lake. What? Or Cabby Lake. Cabby Cabby Lake. Baby, baby, baby. Gosh darn it. These code names, they're killing me. Killing me. And they're all lake names, so... Sound alike. But anyway. So, uh, the big deal here is uh, it is released using the 14 nanometer plus plus product from Intel, which sacrifices some of the die space to increase um, a couple of the dimensions in there to allow for better switching speed and less leakage. So hopefully you can clock these up a little bit higher. And as we know, the burst on the 8700K goes all the way to 4.7 gigahertz on a single core lightly threaded, which is a pretty significant chunk up from uh, the previous. The 8400, I think it what, goes from 2.8 gigahertz to 3.7. Was that correct? Or am I... Maybe I should, you know... I do believe look at the you are right. Storage. And if you haven't noticed, the... Uh, if if you go to the first page and you see the YouTube icon with the uh, the paper boat on uh, the sea, the lake of coffee, clever. That's very impressive. If only, if only they would have had a life raft behind it with a rising chip, it would have been even better. But alas, I, I got shut down on that. No, a thread ripper <laughs> coming up sideways like a shark fin. <laughs> oh yeah, that's no. No, we're not going to do that. Otherwise, Francois would be very, very angry with us. Um, so, yeah, the 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 i5-8400 is a 2.8 to 4 gigahertz. So that's, you know, one of the faster i5s. And plus, that's a 6-core. The 8700K is a 6-core 12 thread. So this is, a you know, a fairly significant jump from the previous 7700K in terms of base clock speed and boost clock speed as well as throwing 50% more cores at the problem. So these are uh, these are some nice-looking parts, and the best part about it is that Intel did not really raise the prices significantly with these new ones. So uh, MSRP of these 8700K is 359 bucks. The 8400 is only 182 So that competes right in the range of the Ryzen uh, 5 1600, which features six cores, 12 threads, and a little bit slower in terms of overall IPC and single thread, but it's going to be faster in, in multi-thread. But this is a chip that is kind of a step away from what Intel has done. And um, you know, we can go into this pretty in-depth because to say that Intel has not been pressured by AMD is kind of overlooking some very basic facts. Um now, that is not to say that Intel has not planned these things out ahead. Obviously, if they were designing these parts and uh, changing around their manufacturing a couple of years ago when they started to go down this road. And uh, they probably had to make some adjustments considering how manufacturing has struggled as of late with uh, Intel's previous kind of TikTok plan. Now it's like TikTok talk. And this... Uh, what is it? The skin, the coffee lake is is kind of the second talk of this group. And uh, to say that they're having some uh, issues supplying demand is an understatement. Uh, they're very, very hard to find. And if you kind of look at Intel in the past, and I think Skylake was one of the previous ones with, where um, the amount of product out there was a little tight. But it didn't seem like it was at this level. So it kind of seems like, I know in the 90s, Intel used to uh, kind of stockpile CPUs from you know when, when production first started to when they actually released by about a six months. And what that allowed Intel to do was release it out onto the uh, market in mass. Um, any kind of demand was, was quickly satiated. OEM, uh, they were able to produce as many products as possible. And so it was a good way to do it. I mean, they, they were just were able to do just drop it on the market, and you could buy these chips on the first day. And while there was a pretty significant amount of chips available, they dried up soon. 
And we have to go kind of then into the other kind of negative of this is the uh, the Z370 and the Z300 series of chipsets. What do you think about that, Sebastian? Hello? What Sebastian? about the naming convention they've had to adopt? Well, no, that, that they... I mean, you ha- it is the same number of pins and same socket. Oh, but right, can right, you- And of course, it, this, I think, will wait till the next story because there was a follow-up about a possible future uh, chipset that may or may not incorporate backwards compatibility, which is a strange rumor that they would release the 8th gen with no 7th gen compatibility and then come out with a later revision that would, in fact, or maybe it could be manufacturer-specific. But have we ever seen this where they maintain the same LGA package and then don't offer any backwards compatibility at all in the chipset? No, they've Not never reassigned really pins seen. like they did with this one. But it is a pin so this swap. One, the pins so do different. They can't. Uh, w- uh, okay. LGA 2011. We had LGA 2011 and 2011 V3, which weren't intercompatible. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. But True. Yeah. But uh, if you, uh, yeah. I think diagrams have been sent out of the the pins. Uh, you know what what they're assigned to. You know, uh, you know voltage, ground, power. Well, voltage and power, same. But uh, <laughs> you know data, and uh, they're significantly different from Cabby Lake to Coffee Lake, and so it makes sense that you're going to have to have a different motherboard because those those pins are just, you know, in a section where you know it's it's a. VDD is is now data uh, in in the previous generation CPUs and that that makes the magic smoke come out and play and that's a bad bad thing. Yep. And uh, so unless yeah, you're really it's, really it's, good uh, at I'm delicate be wiring, curious to hear about what's that? Unless you're really really good with delicate wiring <laughs> and, and can have the chair <laughs> out of it and have it, you know, it'll add some latency, but it should work. Go for it. Should yeah. Uh, it's going to be interesting to hear about any kind of RMA issues that uh, this will see of people attempting uh, to put in the C of the CPUs. I wonder if it will actually physically damage either the CPU or motherboard, or if it just won't run. Uh, so pe- People have tried at least uh, Cabby Lake CPUs in the Z370 motherboards, and it, I don't think it destroys anything. It just doesn't work because I yeah. think it's I think it's smart enough to try to pull like the ID or microcode off the processor to figure it out before it starts throwing a bunch of voltage at it through pins. You're probably correct. But anyway, in terms of performance, the 8700K is a very good performer. It uh, has the best single thread application. The addition of two extra cores and four threads uh, really allows this to compete much better with the Ryzen 7 series of, uh, of products pretty much across the board. Um, You've got still four more threads with Ryzen and a, a little bit more price uh, involved. It's what fifty to a hundred and a hundred bucks or so. I know that uh, when this released, the Ryzen seven eighteen hundred X was at three ninety nine. So that's kind of an interesting reaction from AMD because obviously the eighty seven hundred K is a threat to what they kind of consider, you know, their their price performance mix. And can you have something to say? The X370 platforms are also going to be significantly cheaper than Z370 motherboards. So that's a certain advantage on the Ryzen side as well. This is correct because, yeah, these uh, Z370 boards are, are not inexpensive. I mean, they're pretty sharp looking machines and uh, motherboards, but uh, they are not cheap. Does anything really stood out about this? How was overclocking? Have you did, was this covered in this uh, review, Ken? Uh, I haven't read the review, but I did a lot of the testing. Uh, I I did some of the overclocking and pretty easily just using even the automatic voltage settings on the motherboard, which usually aren't ideal and are a little high. I got it to five point one gigahertz on all cores, pretty stable. On mm-hmm. we're using like a dual one twenty all in one radiator system. So I, I was I was pretty impressed with that. You could get it to above five gigahertz pretty easily on our sample, which was nice. Yeah. Well, yeah so again, you know, figure out, higher threads. Go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, Kyle managed to get them to five gigahertz, and that was the eighty six hundred K. 
Oh, that's nice. Uh, as opposed to the 8700K. So there, there is headroom there. Um, as long as you're familiar with your BIOS and what it's doing, which I think we'll get into in a minute here. <laughs> but yeah, it seems overclockable. Yep, the, apparently, the, we got it up to 5.1 gigahertz, according to these charts in the review. Yep. Resulting in 82 watts of additional power draw. <laughs> it's been a common theme lately, hasn't it? I, I, yeah, it's hard to... I have to remember, this is a six-core part, so yeah, overclocking on six cores. And we haven't mentioned this yet, but there was the whole issue of... Uh, motherboards whether they do or do not have the like so-called multi-core enhancement enabled whatever the branding is by motherboard can cause significant increases in thermals and power consumption as well with these parts well, yeah because instead of like josh was saying you hit 4.7 on a single core and lightly threaded if you have this enabled you hit 4.7 on all cores Right, Solid. now you're talking so, yeah. 4.7 on six cores, and yeah. the automatic voltage settings are having to kick in, and you're actually doing an overclock without even touching anything. All you do is install the CPU, run Windows, and you've got this thing. Hopefully, you've got adequate cooling. Yeah, we, we, we haven't we haven't had a whole lot, lot of time to dig into that this week, since we have a lot of people out, but... Uh, I will say our testing was done with the multi-core enhancement stuff turned off and the CPU ratios set appropriately. It's not, I forget what the actual stock setting is supposed to be, but not sync all cores. I, I, I can't remember the exact toggles, but I know we specifically had it set to the Intel recommended out of the box one instead of what some of the UEFIs were doing. So mm -hmm. none, none of that should yeah. apply here. This should be our, our sample and as it should run in any motherboard well well it's kind of interesting to also see oh sorry go ahead to go run on. over you um is is kind of the the progression of tdps with intel in their past four generations of parts uh what 3770k was was it a 77 watt part that sounds right yeah and then as we kept going up each generation, they, they kept crawling up and up and up because I think the original 2600K um, was a 65-watt a part. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we I mean, they, they continually just kind of added more to it, ramped up that TDP. I mean, it was in little bits and pieces because, you know, AMD always had a 95-watt uh, FM2 and FM2 Plus products, and then their uh, AM3 Plus were 130-watt. TDPs up to going up to 219 <laughs> watt yeah. for their FX 9000 series. And so uh, it's interesting to see that manufacturing is kind of bitten Intel. They don't have quite the lead that they previously did. And I was talking to Ashraf about this. Uh, he's a guy from the Motley Fool that uh, posts quite a bit of stuff. And the manufacturing group has been challenged uh, to get I mean, they no longer have the three-year lead that they were kind of used to. And, in fact, you look across the landscape of manufacturing, and it's really fractured. It's, I mean, we've got some parts that say they're 14 nanometers, some that say they're 16, and dimensions and, and specifications are all over the place. It's kind of the Wild West of, of manufacturing. And Intel is right in the middle of that. I think that they still have probably the best 14 nanometer process and they probably will be out first with their 10 nanometer parts but they do not have the advantages that they previously did and so you know amd has got some breathing room to catch up um, the other uh, uh, fabs are, are certainly catching up as well uh, global foundries did really well with uh, samsung's 14 nanometer licensed product um tsmc has a very solid 16 nanometer they're now going to a 12 nanometer part that will mm -hmm. be seen early next year and so uh this is really the, the 8700 series is quite interesting just because of how it's able to clock up how they've actually kind of again expanded the die size not just because they added only you know two more cores and some cash but some of the base dimensions had to be bigger to get it to perform better and not just be, you know, a leakage monster. Um, 
so yeah, it's 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 an interesting product, and I think people are going to be happy to see that they can push in terms of overclock farther than they have been able to since you know the the. 4700 series, the 6700 series, and 7700 series were not superb overclockers. I guess the 47 series were okay. But everything past that, um, lower overclocks, more heat produced, and just it was harder to get things stable. And now we're kind of took a step back in terms of manufacturing, and you're able to get these higher uh, over overclock uh, results. So that's that's fun and exciting. Any closing thoughts on the series of parts from Intel? Uh, I don't. Did we touch on the eighty four hundred at all? Really? Because Not the, much. Go the, ahead and the eighty four hundred is a really little. interesting part. Uh, I now I'll have to go back and look at exact numbers, but uh, price to performance, it did really well. So if if Alex goes ahead and pulls up this chart on the on the. It's on the stream I, I here. I have no browser feeds at all. There are oh, no Oh, well, browsers. then I'll just narrate, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it was actually our highest performance-to-price ratio in just about every benchmark we ran. Uh, it's The MSRP is supposed to be, what, 189 I think, for the 8400? Although you can't yeah, find it for that. 184 but good luck finding yeah. it. Yeah, the only place I could find it this week was for 250 I think, at Micro Center, which that's a whole other thing. They were charging, trying to charge $500 for the 8700K when they had in stock. Yeah. Micro Center being the one vendor that usually undercuts MSRP on CPU prices. Uh, so that obviously tells you about how much stock is out there right now. Do you guys think that this is mostly a stopgap launch until Cannon Lake... And that we won't actually see a lot of these parts in the wild. I think we're actually going to see a lot of parts in the wild because yeah. getting to ten minute nanometer is is so challenging, and uh, you just don't. Uh, I mean, it was it was quite a bit of development to get into this, and I mean they're using kind of the next, well, a half generation of, of fourteen nanometer with the fourteen plus plus. So I think that these are probably going to be around a lot longer than uh, maybe some investors and uh, some of the administration at Intel would like. But I don't think it's 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 not a knee-jerk. Well, it's something of a knee-jerk. Well, and I, it's I, think something the timing, I think the timing is knee-jerk. I think the, these were obviously planned parts. They couldn't pull these out of their butt. But the fact that it's being released right now when obviously the stock is not there, I think is definitely a reaction to AMD. Yeah, I think that's that's an accurate statement. Yeah, because Intel does like to stockpile up a lot of chips before they release. But in this case, you know, it's lovely to see AMD drop something where Intel is like, um, yeah, let's just get this out the door now and uh, we'll we'll catch up in a bit. And I doubt it'll take them very long, like a couple a month at most before you start seeing good stock. But I, I think this guy will be around for a while. Uh, like as Josh says, it's going to be a, a lot of expensive work to get 10 nanometer at the door. But we shall see. Yeah, it's something else that I was going to say here, but of course, uh, with all the hub of blue, I, I've forgotten, <laughs> but that's fine because it's probably inane and inaccurate, <laughs> which is like my middle name. So uh, yeah, they're, they're interesting parts. Um, if they ever show up at MSRP, they're going to be really interesting parts. But until they can get to that point, I mean, they kind of have the opposite problem that AMD had with the Ryzen release. AMD had plenty of CPUs and not a whole lot of motherboards. And we have motherboards at the yin yang that support these things, but CPU stock is is rather grim. So wait a month, and I imagine that uh, stocks will come back up, prices will sink back down. And uh, it's going to be an interesting chip, I mean, especially for those, you know, doing any kind of gaming and and multitasking. The extra two cores on the 8400 is a big boon because it seems like four cores were getting pretty saturated on a lot of these products. And adding another two at 182 bucks, that's pretty nice. Maybe not as nice as, you know, like the 1600X in, in terms of threads and price, but... If you're just looking for a really solid gaming CPU, it would be hard to go wrong with that one. 
Yeah, it's nice to have the option for more cores in the lower cost platform without losing your single thread performance, which was always the downside to the Ryzen 7 and to some extent Ryzen 5 products. Yeah. And so we uh, we linked to a couple other reviews from Hard OCP and who's XL? Extreme, oh, extreme overclockers. Yeah, and, and then uh, a little tech report kind of action. Like but yeah, what does uh, Jeremy do? What do these folks uh, oh. say about them? Is it well, if you dump uh, liquid nitrogen on top of one of these 8700Ks? Well, you know, uh, 6.2 gigahertz, or sorry, 6.8 gigahertz. Yeah, perfectly reachable. That's a lot of gigahertz. That, that's like better than Celeron overclocking. <laughs> like the old style, not the new style, but the old one. Like It's, it's impressive. So, so do we actually have a number on how much the, the open circuit phase change nit- liquid nitrogen cooling actually costs to run per minute? More than two dollar. Go with that. I think your lifespan might be shortened a bit if you try to run your processor at six point eight gigahertz all the time. Just a hint, but maybe. Just maybe. What you're saying the silicon doesn't like a negative one hundred and eighty five Celsius? <laughs> that's that's stressful somehow. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I had to unmute, but moving along. Uh, FSP Hydro, 750-watt platinum power supply review. And, of course, our power supply review does an outstanding, outstanding job. And what's special about the uh, Hydro? Is that the, the fan? It's not water-cooled. Used? It's what? It's not water-cooled, although the name might make you think that. It really does make me think that. Yeah, one it's, it would. It's, it's actually the fluid. It's the fluid dynamic bearings. That's why they go with this this moniker. It's it's a series that's been around for quite a while. Um, and this will be a nice new refresh with uh, fancy fans on it. Uh, it's the uh, sorry, the model that uh, Lee did was a 750 watt. Um, although they do come in 550 and 650 watt models as well. And this will be one, if I can get a look at the back of it, that I believe has the switch on it to allow uh, for completely silent cooling. Or completely silent operation uh, until it hits a certain about 50, 55% load. But uh, my internets are being (laughs) Wyoming-ish and not coming up. We're all having one of those nights, apparently. Yep. Yeah, the somebody's attacking the backbone, damn it. Yeah. So it's a 750 watt power supply, but it's 125 bucks. I mean, it's it's not inexpensive. You're, yeah, you're paying for the efficiency certainly. It's got the nice convenience things, but we're we're seeing more and more power supplies come out with like the ribbon style cables and which make cable management a lot easier. The uh, the capacitors are going to be part of it, but that also helps with the efficiency. And this thing is, I believe, a platinum. Yes, it's platinum uh, rated. And past that easily, it looks like. So as far as low noise. And to answer Jeremy's question, uh, it does not have a switch anywhere on that that, that provides nope. it. It's just one power switch on it, and that's it. So I imagine it just automatically assumes, as long as it's under 55C or whatever, that it's just not going to run the fan. It doesn't need to. But look at the size of those capacitors. If you have the not fan clicked on starting at 60% the review, load, so yeah. yeah. I threw the link up there. Take a look at it. Yeah. It's nice. But, I we mean, like a nice, the fact busy kind of power once supply. It hits, once it hits 20% uh, load, it never dips below 90% efficiency again. And Which is, it has a 10-year warranty. Good. That's real good. You're saying I don't know. About warranty, One, Sebastian? This much money, it sounds like a lot for 750 but really 125 bucks if you're getting that kind of efficiency and a 10-year warranty and it's got a really quiet like hydro bearing fan on it. That sounds good to me. <laughs> and you got to pay extra for the lack of RGBs too. 
I mean, it, that does cost yes. more nowadays. That's uh, stealth Each. mode. That is stealth that is technology. cheap at half the price. Wait a minute. But it does have interchangeable side stickers if you really need color. Nice. What is the long and short of uh, what did what did uh, what did Lee take a look in the final thoughts and conclusion of this monstrosity? Uh, he, he he is also correcting me. There is no semi fanless operation at all on low power, <laughs> so it will always keep spinning. I was probably thinking of a different series. Just keep spinning. Just keep spinning. Just keep spinning. Yeah. So anyway, strengths. Continuous Everything. DC output at 50 degrees Celsius. High efficiency, 80 plus platinum. The quiet 135 millimeter hydrodynamic bearing fan. Good voltage regulation. Good AC ripple. All the electrical characteristics are fan Fantastic, fully modular with flat ribbon style cables. It's a lie, crossfire, VR ready. I don't know about VR ready. That's just kind of a silly moniker to do on a power supply, but whatever. Uh, plenty of different protections OCP, OVP, SCP, OPP, UVP, no, and of UVP course and OTP. OTP. Yeah, no semi though. The Yeah, 10 years. 10 years is nuts for a power supply. Those must be so it's really. It's becoming very common. A lot of them it's still amazing to me. Year now. Just because yep. I grew up in, in the time of, of crap capacitors, <laughs> which would expand and blow up after about three years, and nobody would oh, yeah. have a warranty and or close to that. Well, there was so only one power that supplies did. have a 10 year warranty now, and yet hard drives have never had shorter warranties than they do right now. <laughs> 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 hard drives have like a one or two year warranty max. As, That's the money is, man. As Alex C points out in the chat, when you get to a ten-year warranty, you're starting to get concerned about the li- the lifespan of the company who's giving you the right. warranty. I don't think FSP right. is going anywhere. They've been around for what, you know, what like fifteen years Damn at this near point, forty probably. years. No, that's I meant in like the PC power supply business, but uh, maybe maybe yeah. longer than that. Uh, yeah, so I don't think they're going anywhere. But that's that's something to start to think about when you have a ten-year warranty. Yeah. Do I and the only company? weakness, of course, is the no semi-fanless operation at low power, as Jeremy mistakenly claimed to have had. <clears throat> I thought it was standard feature now. You would think that. <sighs> Canadians, so spoiled. Jeremy, True. do some hey. research. God. Yeah. You know, yeah, quit I, drinking I the maple syrup that and actually read. Cab ride home to do the research. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Jeremy. And FSB's been around uh, since 1993, know, according to the Internet Database. Ah, the Internet Database. <laughs> the uh, Wiki Internet Database. <laughs> the Internet said so. No, I'm sorry. The PC Perspective Internet Database. I'm looking through, uh, yes. Our How encyclopedia, which is uh, for Patreon subscribers only. We'll send you the link. <laughs> sure you will. <laughs> Session Somebody right went on. on a big trip this week. And when uh, I talk a big trip, it was a big trip, and they wrote about it. Uh, Someone uh, talked to Lenovo, and they took pictures, and they had a little sushi. Uh, a, little, a little bit of sushi. A lot of, a a lot of stuff that has at least a hint of fish taste in it. Uh, yeah, so... And that I was just the last one. We'll leave that one right there. <laughs> right? Uh, if... I think you guys talked about it. I listened to, like, the first 15 minutes of last week's podcast, but I was in Japan for the Lenovo ThinkPad 25th anniversary event which is actually kind of a fortuitous date because I'm only, as we discovered during the event, six months older than the ThinkPad line of products <laughs> uh, because it was October and I was born in April of 92. So that's your little fun fact for the day so you can all feel old. Uh, Thank you. But in uh, in true yeah, Lenovo fashion. That was fashion, unnecessary and rude and I don't appreciate it. I think it's fantastic, really. Yeah, so it was completely appropriate for the show. Yeah. Uh, when I was 25, I had hair, too. Mm, Not much, oh but no. some. Oh, no. What's going to happen mm. to me? I didn't have a ThinkPad, though. No. But I do remember those things. Those are huge, black, oh, they were big weird-looking yeah, bricks. But And they had kind of the interesting edge uh, around, the, uh, around the flip-up part. It was yep. like, you know, kind of the top of a... Uh, a pizza box. Do you remember that? Do you have pictures? Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway. pictures. I have photos of the original one. It's just not in this article. Oh. Yeah, I know. I disappoint. 
Uh, anyway, but, but the, go ahead and talk to us. Yeah, so the ThinkPad you're referring to, the 700C, the first one, rolled off the line October 5th, 1992, I believe. And they've been, the ThinkPad line has stayed in Japan ever since. So even through the acquisition of Lenovo buying the ThinkPad brand and teams from IBM's, well, now non-existent desktop division, uh, it stayed in Japan. Originally, they were in Yamoto City, And they relocated to Yokohama in 2011, which is why they still call it the Yamoto Labs. I guess just a legacy uh, naming scheme there. And this is where we got a a sort of a peek into what testing goes into making a ThinkPad a ThinkPad. So there are a whole buttloads of tests that people need to, or that these devices need to go through, and all of their devices, not just the notebooks. So things like the X1 tablet go through the same array of tests as any of the traditional notebooks. So any item bearing the ThinkPad, the ThinkPad name essentially goes through these array of tests. And I guess the uh, the desktop presenter thing's still not working, Alex? It's, well, it's frozen. Let me give it one more time, because this is definitely a media-heavy article. Well, here, do we want to take this as a time to restart BMix? Because I think this we had to do last time to fix it. Uh, see if it's back now. Uh, yeah, let me kill it and bounce it. The wrong decibels. Well, that's they an need to be uh, doing, chamber. Doing more audio, right? Well, if you if you go down a bit, you can see audio testing oh. in the Hemi I'll go down, right? chamber. So did they okay, make you so the sit other in there for five signal? minutes in absolute quiet and, and and see if you went insane? It wasn't quite five minutes, but it was definitely disconcerting to be this guy, to hang out in the anechoic chamber. It's It's such a weird feeling to have essentially complete silence. My tinnitus would probably be bad. Yeah, mine wasn't great. Uh, so if you have, so we have the Hemi Anechoic Chamber where they do noise level testing. Not exactly a unique thing in the industry, but I did appreciate the little human analog they have with the ThinkPad Polo. Just, just the attention to detail. <laughs> there, as he gropes it. <laughs> And then uh, you don't really get the full effect from this photo, but here is a industrial freezer full of ThinkPads that we got to walk into. So they test these uh, notebooks under a bunch of different scenarios for extreme cold, extreme heat, humidity. They try to emulate the environment that these machines will go through in the shipping container. So extreme heat, cold, maybe some moisture in the air, just try to cover all their bases and like part of the reason they are the ThinkPad has been the only laptop in space, as they like to say, is because they go through a lot of this extreme scenario testing so that they already had a baseline for which they could validate the machines for more advanced operations like military and space applications. So the freezer photo, is that where they were uh, benchmarking the machines? Yeah, that, that's where they get all their benchmark results. No, oh, of no, course. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe the sustained clock speeds they get from yeah, those laptops. It's incredible. It's five gigahertz. It's weird. But that battery efficiency. <laughs> and then if we just take a look at a couple more of these tests, we can get into the more abusive scenarios, such as the free fall drop test. Which, if you listen to the audio of that video, it makes just a just a real nice sound when it impacts flat. Oh, I, I know exactly what that sound is. <laughs> and if you think they're taking the easy way out by just sort of impacting the flat bottom of the machine, 
where it might be more reinforced. They also do just this terrible, terrible test, which is the straight corner drop test down into that very thick plate of steel. And I mean, these are what that sounds like. Yeah, these these are the tests that they have to successfully pass to launch a product. Uh, We have static discharge here, so they go ahead and essentially shock shock the crap out of the think pads shocking including i thought this was cool they will charge up the usb connector of a mouse and then plug it into the machine while it still has a highly it's while it's still highly charged and then make sure that it plugs in and the mouse still works so you, you see i'm going through that here which is sort of an interesting side of esd that you don't necessarily think about all the time is peripherals uh no, don't do that <laughs> a lot of LCD testing, as you might expect. Lenovo is very proud of their hinges, and apparently these robots robots are as well. <laughs> they have a, well, just a miserable experience opening and closing all day. Exercise. Feel the burn. <laughs> and then uh, LCD impact. This is one of the tablets. I believe this is an X1 tablet that they're testing and just kind of taking a linear actuator and going straight down on that LCD to make sure that it doesn't fail within reasonable amounts of pressure. Pressure, And then uh, the final test I put in this article was uh, impact and vibration testing. So you can see if, actually if we make this full screen, there's a ThinkPad, there's a ThinkPad in the middle here sandwiched, and then there's actually force being applied on the lid of the machine. And this test is supposed to emulate a ThinkPad in a backpack with some heavy textbooks as a student is walking around from class to class apparently as i started analyzing uh broken think pads and warranty claims that was one of the like, most unthought of scenarios they had was okay we, we tested for, for vibration but people would put it in bags with heavy things and they would press down upon the lid and start to fail so they they fixed that a number of years ago and yeah it was super interesting to see kind of the testing that goes into a think pad I've been in a couple of other labs like this for other manufacturers, notebook lines. Uh, the ThinkPad one definitely seemed most intense out of everyone that I've been to, which you would expect, considering that's sort of their namesake of the brand is extreme reliability and durability. So, yeah. Cool. Well, I'm glad you had a nice time. It sounds like I'd like, I, I've only been to Japan once, and that was just to the Tokyo Narita airport. Yeah. Passing through. But they had they had really good noodle place with golden curry and that was fantastic. That's all you can ask for, really. Yeah, and and well, yeah, I I don't ask much, <laughs> ever. What kind of a time <laughs> commitment is the flight, Ken? Uh, so I flew, I connected in Minneapolis, which is like an hour and a half from here, and there it was twelve and a half hours, and was like ten and a half on the way back, because you. That's fly. not bad. You fly, you fly over you the top. You get a trade wind. Yeah, yeah. And you fly over the pole, so it's not as long as you might think. It wasn't So bad. is it kind of cool looking out the window and, and just seeing large expanses of ice? No, that's all melted. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened when you got to that the end? The... Did you spot the Russian ship doing the uh, <laughs> transverse of the Arctic? You know, yeah, I'll tell you, the, the, when flying back from England, we did fly over the southern tip of Iceland. No, Greenland. <laughs> and that that is the most rugged looking, nasty terrain you could ever possibly imagine. I mean, it's 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 amazing looking. So, yeah, whenever you're in an airplane and you're going across to Europe, take a look at that because it it is really Anybody who even thinks about trying to set up a settlement there, I mean, are just insane. But <laughs> yeah. Well, here, yes, there. my ancestors were. And still are. Yes. To this day. <laughs> so cool. I'm glad Ken had a nice time there. It's interesting content. And definitely read through it. Go through the videos. Uh, lots of fun, fun stuff. You probably didn't know about uh, in terms of laptop testing. I mean, they beat the living crap out of those things. Yeah, I, I felt bad for some of those machines. Okay, so going on to news of interest. Those are our main things. So uh, you were over there for the limited edition ThinkPad anniversary 25. Tell us about it. Uh, So they've been teasing this for a couple of years. They kind of 
put out in social media if anyone would like to see a retro thinkpad and they got a lot of response so they sort of put that in development that was probably two or three years ago at this point and they've finally launched it after just merciless teasing over the years uh it's built on the existing thinkpad t470 uh actually the the thinkpad i have in front of me is a t470s which is the slightly thinner version of the chassis but it's it's essentially this form factor a 14 inch machine it has a i5 7500u i believe uh 16 gigs of memory a nvidia 940 mx gpu and a 14 inch 1080p matte screen matte touchscreen a fairly good uh, ultrabook specs but the important thing is it has this nice retro rgb thinkpad logo on it yeah yeah, yeah. can i interest you I the whole i thought the word think was also rgb i guess i don't remember yeah, I don't, nope i don't think it was not it, it was, was just pad okay yeah i just don't see ibm on it anywhere no Very weird huh? and I, actually the the really cool part of this machine is the keyboard so they brought back the traditional ibm style photo might load one day uh the traditional ibm style seven row keyboard with the blue enter key and the more traditional keycap style instead of the uh chiclet keys that we'd all all gotten used to and i can report back they should have never stopped making these keyboards they're wonderful the first time i used one of these last week i typed perfect sentences on it it is a dream to type on however the thing that's not a dream is the price so this is obviously going to be a fairly low volume product. They're targeting ThinkPad fans, people who actually care about the legacy of ThinkPad and the retro design cues. So it's nineteen hundred dollars for this for this notebook. Comparing it to a similar spec T four seventy, which is the chassis it's based off of, it's like a four or five hundred dollar price premium probably. And for that kind of money. You could probably mod the ThinkPad logo yourself. <laughs> I, a couple of people in the comments were talking about it. I'm curious if anyone will be able to, like, if you can fit this keyboard into the chassis of the 470. Because that would be interesting. If you could just, like, replace the top plate, if you could get that part somehow and uh, swap that in. I will say, however, uh, ThinkPads seem to kind of always be on sale on the Lenovo website. They don't say at MSRP very long. And actually, on the 5th, when this launched, uh, they had a sale where it was going for like fourteen or 1500 I think. Maybe like fourteen fifty, which I think is a reasonable price for a machine of these specs. And if you've got the limited, a limited edition thing, the really cool keyboard, uh, it, not, not that bad of a deal. So if you keep your eyes out for any sales, it's pretty good. There's one yeah, I remember those keyboards. It. They were sweet. Yeah, it's yes, they were such smooth, smooth action. And you, yeah, you kind of you kind of yeah, forget because we've been using notebook keyboards that are all pretty similar across all manufacturers these days. But they really had something special there, and it would be nice if they brought it back in a wider sort of array of products. Outstanding. Well, uh, thank you, Ken. Okay. Thank you, Josh. As we previously mentioned, the Z300 series have launched with the top-end products, the three Z370. Uh, Sebastian, did yes, you cover this, Josh. or was it uh, Jeremy? Well, it might have been me. Hello. I can dig it. It's well. The the first up, we have uh, Asus with their ROG and the uh, they they launched the Maximix. Maximus X and then there's Strix 370 series and the Strix stuff is fantastic I have I think to say it's, I just got a Strix I think it's probably the Maximus 10 Maximus oh I'm sorry <laughs> Asus following it in Apple's footsteps and releasing products with the Roman numeral 10 I'm sorry it looks like a capital to be X. fair they've used Roman numerals up to 10 as well <laughs> 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 calm down <laughs> So, of course, the most overbuilt, uh, unnecessarily <laughs> appointed uh, motherboard I've ever seen. Uh, what is the price on this thing? Okay. Uh, I've, I've had a Maximus before, I think. This I isn't say like about $399. That's, yeah. That so sounds about well, right. 3 and go up. Yeah, they're not inexpensive. 
Yeah. So, I mean, this looks like it has the built-in water block for the VRMs, the EK water block there. I'm sure it has just every feature they could possibly think to throw on a motherboard at this point. Uh, I, I fun think really, that really good slot. audio into these, and it's got... I guess this one only has two M.2 slots, so I don't see a third slot. As, as Alan will tell you, because he always looks for them, there are very few motherboards that have existed with three M.2 slots. He likes... I, I think the Hero and the Apex have three, the rest have two. Hmm. But even like and, the tiny little guy, the uh, Strix Z370G and uh, the Mini ITX Z370i Gaming all have two. That's impressive on so the it, ITX. It, it is. Uh, it's a tight little board. The, uh, so I have a, a Strix H270i Mini ITX board. And even that thing has two M.2 slots. There's <laughs> one on the front and one on the back. Which is ridiculous for a board that sells for like 119 Yeah. The Strix stuff is a lot more affordable than, than the previous like ROG stuff. And it's very similar as far as like what you get in the box. Like the number of accessories and yeah, the premium packaging and whatnot. Really, they, they've kind of brought Strix up to be a brand of ROG in the past couple of years. I don't think it was always that way. I thought it was its own separate brand at some point. And now it has most of the same features. It's yeah. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. I have a, it, this just looks like a, a ROG product. Yeah. And it just has Strix branding. I have the Strix Z270, whatever the micro ATX one is in my machine. And yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it's a very premium product. Uh, we use well, the Z370. I mean, they're now referring to them as ROG Strixes. Yeah. Like yeah. if you look at the full on uh, title that they give them, uh, it is as I scroll down on ASUS here, ROG Strix Z three seventy U gaming, F gaming, H gaming, G gaming, and then the I gaming. But they're all ROG Strixes now. Yeah, so it's like everything's Republican gamers. <laughs> we use the Z three seventy Strix G for our review, and that's that's actually a really cool looking motherboard the micro. too. Uh, I guess it, I don't know if it's micro or full size. Yeah, I guess, I guess that would be the micro, but it's, it's a similar design to this, but all silver. So all of the heat sinks and stuff are just a kind of matte brushed silver look and it looks really cool. I was impressed. Speaking of you micro, that's EVGA's branding for their micro ATX motherboards. That's some pretty good branding. Uh, and, of course, EVGA, Intuitive. among other manufacturers, also announced their lineup of Z370 boards, which include the Classified, the FTW, for the win, and the Micro. And They don't have nearly as many uh, <clears throat> SKUs as ASUS does. No. It's Doesn't like, ASUS have like 12 of them for the 370? It's like good, better, best, and that's <laughs> it. I don't, they don't have a, no. a mini ITX offering here in this press release. Which might be a little bit later. I remember I got a, a Z170 EVGA board a couple years ago on a Mini ITX, and it took a little while before those were available. It took a, a few weeks until I could actually find one in stock anywhere. So that might be forthcoming. Of course, this is assuming you can even get your hands on that, you know, Coffee Lake i7 that you've had your eye on for $600 or more on eBay, as they're currently selling for. That's ludicrous. But all of these well-appointed, as I look at the uh, spec lists here, I like how everybody's going to these heavily fortified PCI Express slots, by the way. And ROG, of course, that, that motherboard has them. Most of the Gigabyte motherboards have them now. These obviously do, this EVGA boards, which can help with SAG from those heavy video cards. And I wonder how much of a cost like Express slots, so. I wonder how much of a What's cost that? increase that is. For them to put on there. Pennies. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, but it looks it's cool. It's actually it literally me, made of pennies. <laughs> <laughs> it inspires confidence in shoving video cards and ripping video cards out constantly. If it only they made the that. LGA sockets with a, a longer like mean time between failure. They should just make sockets actually... again. Boom. Done. No. no. Yeah. Bad idea. I loved, I no. loved slotted <laughs> processors. <laughs> I was oh, too scared God. to build Slockets? with a socket no. and CPU when I started. I mean, the daughter board that sits on to fit that many pins will probably be the size of the motherboard, but hey, that's fine. 
It just looks cooler yeah. that way. Just got a you right a angle. Huge daughter board sticking yeah. out of the system. <laughs> so anyway, the EVGA boards, let's see how many M.2s. Uh, two. So you have two for like full 80 millimeter like M key slots for your SSDs. PCI G- Gen 3. Yeah, the, the classified's got three. Or, or, sorry, uh, all but the small one has have three. Hmm. Yeah, but the the third one is just for like your wireless or other card. You know, it's Only an two M2 of them are full e bandwidth, thirty two gigabit M. slots. Yeah. Nice. Well, let's uh, got good the that we've killer got double shot product products too. Down. Anyhow, uh, moving along, leaked update shows Intel launching new three hundred series chipsets in two thousand eighteen. So obviously, we got the Z three seventy now. But what do we expect here come 2018 and CES time? I love the Jeremy? fact that they've had to uh, potentially go to B360 instead of B350 <laughs> because of a certain other B350 that's already on the market mm-hmm. from AMD. Because that wouldn't be confusing no. at all. Well, and to make it more confusing, on the business side, you get Qs. The Q370 and the Q360, just to add more letters and numbers to this <laughs> alphabet soup of, I want to buy a computer, and I'm, I'm a little bit confused because one single number means it's a totally different company. And this frustrates me. I'm confused by the Q in general. That, like, I, my only experience with the Q motherboards were, like, the uh, Q, I think it was, like, a Q87 I had the thin mini ITX board. I thought it was just like a thin mini ITX like specific chipset, but apparently not. Freaking Biostar or something, wasn't it? Uh, mine was an Asus, but oh, okay. They've it's listed here as like server workstation, but I'm not sure what the actual application of the Q boards is. But this is also where uh, some of the rumors came from, because this Z370. Apparently, the engineering boards could do Cabby Lake R and Coffee Lake. So that's sort of where this whole maybe there will be backwards compatibility at some point came in. But for any of the retail boards, it's going to be Coffee Lake and Coffee Lake only. What if it's a what if it's a bio switch and just reassigns the pins in software? Stop it. Stop it. (laughs) It's a conspiracy, Josh. And I'm going to find that BIOS and I'm going to flash this board. Please do. I, I and yeah, use your hammer to install that LGA CPU. Get a C clamp. Just to. To get it's a the big old C pens, baby. clamp. It's just going in. Yeah, I can't yeah. confirm. It does just go in. It does. Anyway, mm. uh, Z390 may replace the Z370. We don't know any details. And let me tell you, the one really super disappointing thing about all of this and these new coffee leg and previous cabby like is it's still 16 pcie lanes off the cpu even amd has got more well it just kind of never gonna need more than 16 pcie lanes shut up bill gates (laughs) 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 isn't there what if you do populate both of those m.2s with like a a by four gen 3 well, SSD. because those all come off the uh, eight lanes set. right there, and they're, then they are all limited by the four lane DMI connection in between the yep. chipset and the CPU. So, so at least some of them are. It's sixteen yeah, plus uh, four. Well, then. it's PCH. Isn't it well, yeah, but those those, those by four are only used for one thing. I mean, you can't. Yeah. I mean, think uh, what AMD's uh, Ryzen is is 32 lanes, but of course, you know, mm-hmm. an X amount of those lanes are not available to you know the board manufacturers. Um, but yeah, they have the uh, M.2s uh, on on the majority of the X370s going direct to the CPU. Hmm. It'd be kind of interesting no, no, to AMD do did it really more. nice because it they really don't care. I give me a PCIe lane, use it for storage. There's no in between. Uh, whereas Intel, I mean, yeah, they're offering VROC, but at the same time, they've added some interesting difficulties well, communicating from the storage to the, the CPU. I mean, so VROC's not this platform at all. That's no. for the enthusiast stuff, the high end enthusiast. 
Yeah. So, in so this anyway, case, it's, it's, those are all coming out. We're happy about that. There, there's More been a PCA rumor. Lanes. Uh, I, I've seen a rumor off and on that there will be an eight core desktop processor with the Z390 launch. I have no idea if that's true, but I think it's interesting to think about nonetheless. It probably but they would go is. desktop and not HEDT for that. Uh, well, I mean, HDT is almost like completely past eight core at this point. If you think mm-hmm. of the yeah. parts they actually want to sell, so it might make sense to have that skew. Just because it's already in the consumer space under five hundred bucks for an eight core sixteen thread part with more PCIe lanes. Hmm. Weird. Hmm. Weird. It makes your Facebooks go really quick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it shall. <laughs> Uh, we have seen now the unofficial launch of the GTX 1070 Ti. This was a rumored middle chip in between the 1070 and the 1080. It features the clocks of the 1080, and it features more cores than the 1070. And However, with that sweet, it should sweet not GDDR5 over- memory that miners love so much. Mm-hmm. So this is not going to be easily available when it eventually no. hips. No. No. Do anyway, be able to find some uh, you know, a little bit of Vega eBay action. It's months. nice to see. You know, the bad thing about me being in Wyoming and you being in Michigan is the latency and the amount of talk over we have of each other is it's disappointing. Oh, it's I, charming. I think it just makes it sound like, you know, like playful banter. We're talking over it's each like other the because view. we don't respect each other. I was going to say, yes. have you watched cable news lately? This is all it is anymore. So there you go. It's people talking over each other. Yeah, I think that's it's it. incredibly insulting, Josh, but also accurate. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can talk louder. Therefore, I'm right. Yes. So anyway, that looks like uh, that will be showing up sooner as opposed to later. And we've got some what looks to be just some legitimate specs. And uh, I think that. Certainly, the, there's there's a price point in there, at least in MSRP, that this can happily uh, exist at. How much? Four hundred thirty. Yeah, it's what so seventy a, bucks cheaper than what MSRP is supposed to be on a 1080 currently. Correct. It, it's, it's ridiculously yeah. tight, and it's just a, it's about thirty bucks more than a Vega fifty six, which puts it in an interesting spot. I mean, it should help. So apparently the, the launch, hopefully. according to this updated article that we uh, sourced from Tech Arp, is October 26 hmm. would be supposedly the launch date at that 429 MSRP in the U.S. Nice. Well, well we, you, we don't have one, like a gigabyte so. link from their Facebook page. They took down, apparently. <laughs> well, it. it it's gone beyond a leak at this point. <laughs> right. It's confirmed. <laughs> well, that's nice. But now that's a water block cooling thread ripper <laughs> with Intermax's liquid AIOs. How big is that water block? It's just as big it's as you need. So Holy big. Yeah. But yeah, that's it's a, a big black box. Underneath it. Are, are those that rivets? survive an airplane crash? Are, are those rivets on the top plate there? For the, I hope not. They, they look like look rivets. Like I doubt they're rivets, but it's so pretty. But rivets. I mean, they no. might be countersunk screws, but let's just say Enermax is not known for industrial design. All right, yeah, we'll go and, with that. Go or with that. water coolers, for that matter. <laughs> True. And not only that, but those screws are differently offset on yeah, each corner. Are. I know. I know. Well, it that's bugs really me. When annoying. When I look at it, it bugs me. You cannot unsee. Oh. Yeah, you can't unsee that. <laughs> it's like they took the screw pattern from something else and just put it on there. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to remake this tooling. Wow. Well, like it's, it's a so little bit bigger, but let's not redo the drill holes. <laughs> it looks like such a beautiful product, but just that one top plate ruins it. Mm-hmm. I will say really the uh, look at the mounting mechanism and how easy it appears to be for an AIO. Just, uh, just and got, from what Kyle said, it is stupidly easy so to put on. You just have the four looks like spring loaded screws. So you just tighten them. You don't have to have a yep. bracket with the clips and the and the teeth and the magnets and the ugh. the worst. Well, Thank guys, you know, Intermax patented 
their uh, shunt channel technology design to enable the cold plate to eliminate the boundary layer to increase coolant flow momentum and accelerate heat transfer performance. And the SCT, as they call it, that's a shunt channel technology. If you weren't paying attention a moment ago, also lets heated and non-heated coolant swap the channel and increase the utilization rate. Mm. So are you reading that that or are you just freestyling? (laughs) I have their web page pulled up and they have some interesting diagrams uh, and a lot of information about shunt uh, channel technology. (laughs) Nice. You know, that's one thing that I think AMD has done really well, at least with Threadripper and this. I mean, it's that mechanism is it's kind of bulletproof. And it's with robust. that torque wrench, as long as you don't do more than one click on the torque wrench, you're going to be fine. Yeah, the torque <laughs> wrench is great as long as you know how a torque wrench works, unlike the, yeah. that guy on YouTube. Yes. You stop so it's cool. I mean, that's, that's a lot of potential cooling space. And not only that, but I mean, if you've got that amount of metal as a cool plate, um, you know, just the, the thermal... Density, well, the, the, the amount of, of, of energy that can actually absorb is is pretty impressive. Well, so I kind of want to get an uh, AM4 system just to test this. You don't I mean, see, like, this is they're planning 100% potential. IHS coverage. Like, it's it's literally covers the entire chip perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind it of a beautiful thing. support a 4 gigahertz overclock, though. The best they could get stable was 3.9. What? That's lame. So as beautiful as it looks, as big as it looks, <laughs> honestly, it it's not really for extreme overclockers. Um, but if you just want to run a thread ripper without a huge buzzing fan, uh, the 360 is not a bad idea. But I mean, remember... As he says, you're dealing with a CPU that's dumping about 360 watts of power at 3.9 gigahertz across all 16 cores. So while I do say, you know, it's disappointing they can't hit four, that's still a crap load of thermal energy you've got to dissipate. Like a ridiculous I wonder if just amount. a bigger loop would, would help out a little bit. Because at some point, you're going to reach an equilibrium point with the ambient temps. So something that Ryan talked about yeah. in his mailbag, I think, last week, where... If this loop just isn't sufficiently large, especially with something that's closing in on 400 watts, you can't well, dissipate it's an that much heat so on a can't. small loop. It's also a 360 all in one, so I don't know how much larger you're going to get. Well, maybe, well, uh, yeah. You'd I have mean, to you go with a thicker, really, really probably. aggressive pump and maybe longer hoses and a larger reservoir. Well, you know bigger. what? Uh, yeah, larger reservoir would, 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 yes. Accept a lot more, you know, obvious heat, and keep a better equilibrium. But yeah, your your cooling eventually is going to be limited as long as you have an X amount of surface area with your with your fan and your radiator. Bummer. That's it. You got to turn into that guy who puts the uh, the big water tank in his backyard and buries it, and fills it up with three hundred gallons of water to recycle through. Did you ever see that guy? Yep. Yep. It was like the, the it was the, the water cooling from hell and it was amazing. <laughs> but I, I'd always thought yeah. of the guy that incorporated the uh toilet bowl tank. The, the the reservoir in the back of the toilet bowl was gonna be the most crazy thing I saw for water cooling. And then I saw that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well moving along, everybody panic. Aim is shutting down. But I see AOL safe. Instant Messenger will go kaput in December. I think I actually used this for about six months at one time. And then, well, it's just, the, you know, it was the world of ICQ, AIM, and then uh, Microsoft came out with the MSIM. Google finally showed up. <laughs> AIM has just been going away slowly. I th- honestly thought it was gone until I saw this story. Yeah, I had forgotten about it entirely. I just knew that I had signed up at one time and I had a couple of friends and then I I stopped running it because I had ICQ, IM, AIM, and that was that was the weak link. I just stopped using it. 
And so, yeah, if you're some kind of lunatic that actually stores stuff <laughs> on your AIM account, you've got until December 15th. After that, it's gone. What could you even store? I, not much. <laughs> can't even play contacts, I don't think. Oh, no, you can't get your contacts out. But what good are they going to be? They stored it in a proprietary way, <laughs> and they can't figure out how to export it. Hopefully I want to know, how can they will. get rid of AIM when they still sell AOL dial-up for fourteen ninety five a month? <laughs> that's a pretty good question. I'm on their page right now. It's unlimited, though. This is unlimited dial-up. Yeah, they dial made that up. switch several years ago to unlimited dial-up. That is nice. I don't have to count hours anymore. No. Get that dedicated I second phone line. I haven't got a anymore. CD from them in a long time. Yeah. No, I've you seen can get one your AOL Advantage free trial today. <laughs> I feel like I've seen a CD. But I haven't seen a 3.5 inch from them. Yeah. I guess the fact that I'm on their website tells them that I have the ability to download <laughs> the software. I would like a physical disc, though. Let me see if I can get that. Oh, man. They offer so many extended benefits here with the Platinum service. <laughs> do they have the probably, five and a quarter? Just do that so you have it in case you need it. Let's see. For just yeah. how much more is it for the Platinum? I might just do it. AOL Advantage Plus. I get uh, some of their highest levels of support and protection features. That's just some of them, though. Advantage Premium Plus. Okay, this oh. gets me the kind of computer support and protection that I deserve. I'm seeing a lot of icons. Uh, AOL member deals, discounts at Verizon, who owns you know, AOL. I, and this I, is actually I, Verizon dial-up. I've got to wonder what the average age of an AOL user is now. Probably 25. A tip now. Yes. Hey, hang on, hang on. The their, their account the is kept AARP open in memory. is one of their main uh, names here. Let's see. Yeah. If I'm 50 or older, uh, there might be an AARP discount here. So I think that tells you something about the demo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Funny times. Another piece of history shutting down. Kind of like yeah. EverQuest and... What was the uh, uh, Asheron's call? Well, they blew everything up. Yep. And probably for good reason. So, Microsoft. Or the original again, Neverwinter Max. Nights. Wasn't wasn't Neverwinter Nights the first true MMO on AOL? No. Come was on. It? Oh, that's... Uh, no. that's like, was it just Neverwinter? That's like Ultima Online. No, no, it was no, before it was, that. Neverwinter was, was before Ultima Online. Before Ultima? It does right? There, there was, there was but multiplayer. Friggin, uh, I mean, there was multiplayer oh, door games back, back in far. the Tribes late seventies, early eighties. So everything goes back to mud. Everything goes back to mud. <laughs> everything goes back to mud. Yes. <laughs> Can we move along? Sure. Eh, it I is guess. getting late. Ken uh, would like to go home. He's tired. No, I'm invigorated. I'm, I'm used to being thirteen hours yet. ahead. This is this is prime time, baby. Oh, great! You can do the after show. <laughs> Microsoft backing away from Windows 10 Mobile. I know a perfect guy to talk about this. His name is Sebastian because he is the mobile guru, or at least wants to be. This is, yeah, exactly. This The latter. This was kind of uh, obvious, but it's interesting that they actually come out and say this. So um, let me look at the actual tweets here, which, of course, are on the display right now. If I just go to that screen. And it was Joe Belfiore. Mr. Who, uh, yeah, was a bad idea. Yeah. It's like, we'll continue to support it. Don't worry. You'll get your bug fixes and OS platform updates. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah, <you're> <laughs> no. But it's just not a focus right now. So in other words, no hard hardware. You're not going to see any Windows 10 phones coming out. Obviously, they're... they're I would say somewhat incestuous relationship with Nokia is over. It's been over for the, a while. Yeah, it's been over for a while because, interestingly, you know, the whole uh, former Microsoft exec becomes the CEO of Nokia, and then suddenly Nokia is exclusively using Windows Phone instead of Android or their own OS, and then those phones don't sell at all, other than, like, the budget sector. And I, I had a couple of these Lumia phones. Like, there was no better, like, 50 to a hundred dollar phone for a while than like a five or 600 series Lumia phone. But then 
problems arose with application support where when they finally hit like we have, you know, 80 to 90 percent of all the apps everybody else has, like the important ones, like the top 40 apps. We have them. We have them. And then months went by and then years went by and they were never updated. And one of the tweets that he put out was we did a lot we're of things to incent. developers to do it. Yeah. And he's like, and I love it when they actually admitted we wrote apps for them. We paid them and they still didn't see there was there weren't enough users to justify them continuing. So, for example, I remember I was excited when the eBay app came out, like, oh, finally an eBay app for Windows Phone, because I'd been using a Windows Phone for like six months at that point. And then it was never updated again. And it was the version that Microsoft wrote for them. There were other things like Pocket Casts is the uh, podcast app I use on Android. And then Pocket Cast came to Windows Mobile. And it was weird because it was exactly the same <laughs> as the Microsoft podcast player, just with a different skin on it. And it was never updated <laughs> this, when I was using it. It's just funny. Like they, they did their best to get the names on the platform. Like we have Evernote, we have Pandora, we have, you know, Amazon, we have, you know, eBay and the list went on. The only app I can remember that they had that was updated with any frequency and was actually a decent app was their Twitter app. But didn't they get into like a pissing match with Twitter for that? Or no, yes. that was a YouTube app. Yeah, yeah. And then the YouTube right. app just disappeared. The fact that you had to use the uh, Internet Explorer browser sucked. A lot of things about the platform were bad. Um, oh, my, my so absolute not... favorite was uh, I had to track down a program which would uh, grab SS, the, the chain of SSL certs so that this Lumia phone made by Microsoft could connect via active sync to our Microsoft Outlook exchange platform. It, it wasn't supported by default. It, it, we actually needed to install the SSL certs to be able to get it to work. Uh, it, it, it seems, it, you bring up a good point. It seems like at least when the platform started, even though it started late, there was an opportunity there where they could have gotten the BlackBerry users if they had really catered to the enterprise market but instead they tried to cater to the consumer market nobody wanted it there and by that time enterprise people had moved on to ios and android and devices they actually wanted to use instead of devices they were forced to use for the most part oh because my blackberry at that time was busy uh let's say defiling canines uh <laughs> It was not pretty, and yeah, they had. A I think that's the less kind way to put that, so Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a better way I could put it. I did in a meeting with them, but mm. it was a rim job. <laughs> oh dear, not anymore. I no you know it's sad because when I when Windows, well, let's see, the Lumia what was it the nine ten? I want to say it was the first really awesome was it 19 or 920 yes it was uh, December of 2000 it was before the one with the, the nipple 14? camera on the back anyway it was fantastic hardware a beautiful screen it was a little thick a little heavy but otherwise it was such a beautiful phone and I bought it right when it came out and just kept waiting for the app support to <laughs> kind of follow and the thing that finally killed it for me and this was on i was on my, my second lumia phone at that point I'd, I'd gotten rid of that one i got another one i had a 635 i think was my last one and no work chat support at all i was having to try to to use other clients and kind of backdoor my way in and looking up like the jabber ids and you couldn't use hip chat there was no like client for it at all i literally to quickly respond to something on the road, I had to go to the Internet Explorer browser and log into the web version of HipChat. So it was just, it was miserable. Yeah. Well, I think you really uh, suffered, though. Suffered for your art. It did support Groove. Oh. Because everyone used. R.I.P. Mm. You know, speaking of strange things on other strange phones, iOS and Android have Edge now. Especially can relive the experience of logging into everything through the browser instead of using apps. Yeah. But now it's Although a generation I wonder if browser. it would give you a better experience on certain sites that tend to depend on IE. What if there's well, that one like work mobile login that you have to have IE for? 
I mean, it's like Dell Tech. <laughs> True. <laughs> but see, the thing is that it's still mostly a wrapper. So if you're running iOS, it's Safari. Uh, but they're using oh, the course. WebKit Everything's to WebKit. make it look like it. And if you're Android, it is. Uh, what do they call that silly thing? Chromium? Chrome. Uh, yeah, it's it's Chromium. Yeah. So it's a modified Chromium browser that looks like Edge. They do both have a little, some of the same tricks that Edge does uh, for, as you say, those Microsoft enhanced sites. And I'm sure that, you know, somebody out there, because uh, I know in the comments, somebody took personal offense to me not being extremely excited about <laughs> this happening. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, if you've got something that needs Edge, uh, and honestly, you know, if you're playing with SharePoint or OneDrive, it actually does make a little bit more sense to play with it that way. So, yeah, congratulations. You, you can now get Edge on your uh, Samsung or your Apple. Or if you just want to fuck with people's statistics for your user browser agent. <laughs> the fuck? Someone's using Edge Mobile? <laughs> <laughs> And it's on there a Microsoft phone. Wait a second, what's going on here? <laughs> it's kind of funny. Finally, it's, it's oh, such, oh, it feels like a concession on Microsoft's part because they don't have really their own phone platform right now. It's not officially dead. It's just kind of on the back shelf indefinitely. But you can get an Android phone. They sent it to a Microsoft's... farm out north. <laughs> yeah. It's not dead, yes, honey. It's, it, it, it went to a beautiful farm. Rigs yeah, to play every day through the pastures, the sheep and the cows. You can get a Microsoft launcher and use the Microsoft browser. And there's a number of very solid Microsoft apps. Yeah, they've been and releasing. Basically, have your own Microsoft phone running over Android. They've been releasing apps on iOS and Android for a couple of years now that haven't gotten to Windows Phone even, like Microsoft's own apps. I know that was that was the other <laughs> big thing. When when Microsoft Office, like a, a better full featured version of it, came out on iOS, and there was absolutely no Windows Mobile support. This was around the same time they killed the Nokia Windows tablet too. You just have to uh, use yep. Continuum to use your Windows desktop apps. Uh, it's so simple. <laughs> Why don't you understand? You have, you have the same experience on every single platform you use, from your desktop to your laptop to your phone. It doesn't work on that. It doesn't work on that. It doesn't work on that. That's same experience. Though. Yeah. Something near and dear to your heart, Jeremy, and maybe even to mine eventually. Oh, I. Mech Warrior returns. We've only talked about Mech Warrior seemingly ad nauseum for the past several months talking about Mech Warrior 2, 3, 4, especially the Mech Warrior 2 ones with, with you know, that, that ushered in the first generation of 3D graphics. So what's going on with Mech Warrior now? Well, Piranha Games is still around. And they're still developing Mech Warrior games. And Mech Warrior Online has kept them on, you know, in, in the red for quite a while now. Or in the black, rather. But I was going to say, it's it's been a long time since I've not had to listen to people say horrible things about relatives of mine online and just be allowed to play a single player game. So they've decided uh, to skip the usual tradition, which was they would release a Mech Warrior game that was a single player campaign, story based, and then a mercenaries version afterwards where it was just a big sandbox they've gone straight to mech warrior 5 mercenaries uh they're putting you in charge of a really broke company of mercenaries uh you, you from what uh, i read in the uh, interview you start out with a single small mech probably a jenner and have to try and figure out a way to make enough money to pay for the bullets that you use to take out the mechs that you went, your lance went and took out. So it's part uh, mech warrior game, but it's also part economic simulator. You're you're gonna have to run a mercenary group. You're gonna have to be able to pay for everything, from the mech repairs through ammunition straight up to the lance pilots. I am excited because this is a, a renaissance. I mean, we've got battle tech. Uh, that had a hugely successful Kickstarter campaign should be out relatively soon. 
uh, MechWarrior Online that was amusing. Uh, MechWarrior Legends that was, you know, it's a lot of fun because it's turn-based. But we just really haven't had a thing where you, you, you honestly feel like you're sitting in 50 to 150 tons of metal stomping across the landscape, destroying everything from buildings to trees to your opponents, hopefully. They're also going to include a lot of uh, the secondary vehicles that you don't see so often in MechWarrior games. So, yeah, you're going to have uh, air support units and uh, crunchies on the ground chewing away at your armor so that the enemies can then hit you a little bit harder. It sounds wonderful. I'm a little bit leery because it's been a long time and I've got some very fond memories of MechWarrior 2 and MechWarrior 4. Or the good old Battletech simulator, uh, which I hope you had a chance at some point to get into. The giant arcade machine that you strapped yourself into and it bounced around and was just a hell of a lot of fun. No word on VR support, although I expect sooner or later it's going to happen and that's just going to be silly. Nice. Here's hope. Well, that's all the news, and I've got to stop putting my arm like this because it looks kind of strange. It's like I've got a hemorrhoid, and it's just really bothering me, and I've got to put the weight on my other cheek. And It's it's like that. <laughs> like it. I don't have a donut yet, so I just need to stop doing it. Yeah, we're all but getting anyway. there. Now on to uh, Hardware Software Picks of the Week. Since Ken is in the big chair, he goes first. The big comfy chair. With the donut. But that chair is neither big nor comfy. No, it's really not. Uh, so I, Jeremy and I started talking about TVs a little bit in the Slack today, which made me think about this as a pretty good pick. It is the, just bear with me, it is the TCL 55P607 55-inch 4K HDR TV. Now I know what you're thinking. TCL, come on, Ken, you can do better than that. However, this TV has been getting fantastic reviews from all of the outlets who have taken a look at it so far. Uh, ratings or Artings or however you pronounce it, R-T-I-N-G-S dot com, who is my most trusted TV reviewer. They go through a, just a buttload of tests and are fantastic about everything. Say this is one of the best TVs they've seen under $1,000 this year. And uh, my buddy picked one up recently, and it's it's a pretty beautiful display, the it sports Dolby Vision and HDR10, which is kind of really? what most 2017, 2017 TVs have settled on, is supporting both formats. Uh, yeah, it's... But if it's, I want to record something, will it actually do tool command language? <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to move straight past that one. But there's it, so many it tickle jokes. Roku. <laughs> So many tickle jokes. Yeah, so TC- TCL is the one with the Roku license at this point, so it has Roku built in. That stuff seems to seems to work all right. It's not necessarily the best. Uh, the are they doing any sort of local dimming at all? Or no? I, I think they are. Uh, I think you almost think you have to to do HDR uh, seventy two zones. Oh wow! Actually, wow. Yeah, way more than I would have expected. Yeah, so it has uh, it, it actually has bucks. and it has three HDMI 2.0 with HTCP 2.2, so three ports that are capable of full 4K HDR, which is actually fairly unusual. There's usually a little less than that, usually one or two. Uh, Boy, six ninety nine. So, so this is six ninety nine for every retailer, but Best Buy. If you go to Best Buy, they have the split, the cousin to it, the fifty five P six oh five which is 599 the difference being that it comes with a different remote so it has just sort of the standard roku remote as opposed to the one with the voice controls and i think a headphone jack on the other model but for a hundred dollars like i would just get the dumb remote if you're if you're only spending 700 bucks on tv if you can save a hundred i think that's pretty good you can still use the Roku app on your phone to control it if you want any more of the advanced features by chance, but I don't really want to talk to my TV that much. So, yeah, it's 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 a killer deal for what it is. They were supposed to do a 
they had announced a 50 inch and a 65 inch version, but they have canceled those for 2017. So I don't really know. I, I think it might have been popular to an unexpected degree. So they kind of put all of the resources into the 55, which they had already launched instead of launching new models. But yeah, definitely take a look at it. And uh, I expect good things from their 2018 TVs at this point. If they can come out with more sizes, that'd be pretty ideal. That's if you're not cool. going OLED, I think this is a great choice. I think you should go OLED. I want to, but so oh, we can't, can't all be like Sebastian. To. I'll never go back. <laughs> That's the problem. That's why <laughs> one of the reasons I have You can't it. go back. Yeah. Well, and here you were used to be in love with a projector. Oh, I, unfortunately, I still have that too. It's, it's kind of a mess. My living room literally right now is a 100-inch projection screen on one wall <laughs> with a... Epson UB fifty or fifty thirty UB uh, projector on the opposite wall, and then on the wall, like in between, I have the uh, sixty five inch B six OLED that I got last year, and then the only other available wall has a sofa on it. So you go into the living room, and it's just like you're surrounded by stuff. Because there's also my hi fi system with like two big Wharftail Jade five speakers and a bunch of stuff on a shelf and a turntable inside of a cabinet. And there's very little living space in the living room, which makes a lot of sense when, when you have a two-year-old. When, when are you going to admit that you have an issue? You have a problem. I think he, that's Josh, what he's doing right now. Oh, Sweet. I, I huh. have sold many pairs of speakers. I'm down to just like seven pairs of speakers now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and actually, I went down from three TVs and the projector to now I only have two TVs and the projector. So, nice. All right. Well, uh, for myself, about damn time, Sanderson. Next month, what? About damn time, Sanderson. Yes. Yes. Finally, we're getting the latest version of uh, of well, the the last of this trilogy. Uh, Brandon is is a prolific writer, but he writes about many, many different things. And I've been waiting for this one for a while. Uh, the first two uh, books have been fantastic. This one, I, I read a couple of release chapters, and it just, just keeps going along. So if you remember Sanderson, he finished up the Wheel of Time series. He's got multiple books out of his own. And Oathbringer looks to be a lot of fun. So get that here next month. I think I'm going back, to get it for back. Kindle. Just don't tell my wife. Look at that cover. That's a good cover. It's a big old but, sword, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Jeremy. <laughs> oh, I, I'm going for pure style here. Uh, this is not a desperation pick in any way, shape, or form. Because, I mean, what household would not benefit by a bunch of cheap-ass plant holders glued to the ceiling that your cords can hang off of. Wait a minute. Because, I mean, gravity is, <laughs> is that not Sebastian's working against house? you. The, the, the <laughs> leverage of your head pulling on that back cord is not going to peel that sticker off in an hour or two. This is it look, Those look like those uh, pet leash retractor things. That would actually be a step up. Why is he holding his hands out? That's, without do, holding do, any trollers. Like, okay, do you big. remember the movie Nine to Five? I uh, mean, I Dolly realized Parton. it was a long time ago. Dolly Parton. Yep. Do you, Do you remember how the how they they got the guy under control? Oh shit! They not had until him this tied up and uh, on at the end of a garage door opener. So whenever he got out of control, they yep. they hit the garage door opener button. And I'm sorry, that kind of looks like it to me. He, yeah, it's your wife it's, gets unhappy with you. She pushes the button. And you're going to be singing soprano. <laughs> <laughs> you get suspended. And, yeah. <laughs> on the on the other hand, it, it's twenty six bucks. So I mean, it's pretty if reasonable. you really wanted to do that, you so know. it's eight little retractor pulleys and, and some like suction eight cups, plant hanger suction cups. Not even command strips. No. I wonder what the uh, totally honest reviews for this product on Amazon have to say about it. 
Well, they're not great. <laughs> uh yeah the one by amazon customer giving it five stars wow this is a must-have i'm guessing that might be the manufacturer yeah that that reminds me of you the think? amazon customer with the uh, solar uh glasses which were all eventually pulled away because they weren't actually blocking out all the uv and we're frying Any people's eyes. UV. It's it's always a good yeah. sign with reviews when it's half five star and half one star, right? Yes. That yeah. means it's totally legit. See, I would just use some paracord and some, you know, standard hooks. You know I what? Just uh, use anything other we, than that. We actually we actually tried something similar to this with the drop ceiling at the old office when we got the VR headset. And I don't remember what the exact problem was, but it actually wasn't ideal having the cord suspended like that. You had to make sure you had, because you, I guess you don't know the right amount of tether that you need to be able to get the full range of motion in all scenarios. Like, occasionally you want a bit more cord and you just can't have it. Right. And, I, and I'm wondering what they're using in this this picture you have with the, on the screen right now. Photoshop. That's what I thought, because yeah, so that, that cable's not, not laying at all. For a Vive <laughs> or an Oculus. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> That picture nice. is a hundred percent legitimate, you guys. <laughs> Obviously. All right. The guy doesn't look three D generated at all. What? What is your choice? Uh, I picked up a Sound Blaster X Fi HD USB sound card recently. I have not taken it out of the box yet. You, I have you a really plan do have for a problem, it. Don't you? What's that? You really do have a problem, don't you? <laughs> I, I we've already discussed this. Anyway, the, the I didn't get this to use it as a DAC. And if you read the specs on it, if you go around online and find pictures of the PCB, and it's got a, a very good quality DAC chip in it, but they're not really using it to the full extent. It's a 192 kilohertz, 24-bit that can do DSD, and they're only using it as like a PCM 2496 DAC. It's not got the separate clocks to do the proper 44.1, 88.2, uh, everything gets resampled to either 48 or 96. So this is not like your audio file solution. But what it does have is a very good quality analog to digital converter chip, the kind of like industry standard Cirrus Logic chip that will encode at high bit rates and very, very good dynamic range and does 24 bit 192. It's the CS5361. So this thing, in addition to a good quality analog to digital chip, has full-size like RCA connectors on the back of it. So you can literally anywhere you can take your laptop, you can plug this external sound card in, and you have RCA in from any analog source. And it even has its own RIAA like equalization built into the software and has a separate phono input with a ground. I don't know how good the ground would be to something that's just plugged into USB on your laptop. But if you don't have a phono preamp and you want to use this to rip your vinyl, you can absolutely do that. So it's an interesting product. It's a hundred bucks at full price, uh, unless you find it for less somewhere um, on Amazon. It's 99 bucks, but just for a very high quality analog to digital converter, with RCA plugs or ports that you can just connect to any Windows laptop. It does it does not apparently have any Mac OS support, but if you have a Windows laptop like I do, then this is all you need to like digitize your analog stuff. Because it retains that warmth when you digitize directly from analog. <laughs> I would say, you know what? I think it does as long as you're doing it at least 24 <laughs> bit. And you probably only need 48 kilohertz, but hey, let's just do it at 96 because we can. Why not? All right, all. That is the podcast. Again, you can watch these things at pcpro.com slash podcast. You can follow Ryan and others at twitter.com slash Ryan Shrout. I've got something. Jeremy's got something. I think Sebastian's got something. He hasn't posted in ages. Ken. Ken's got lots of followers. He's he's very popular. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, 
Be still Again, young find and us cute. at twitter.com slash pcper. And uh, with that, I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. Sebastian. Look up Sebastian. I'm Sebastian Peak. And I'm um, twitter.com slash Ken underscore Addison. Brand new. Sure that's how you do it. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, well, if you listen to this during the day or morning, Godspeed. you're just not getting the full effect. Yeah. Good night. <laughs>